So for our visitors today, uh, Daisy, um, you're uh, an artist and designer, Dr. Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg. Um, my name is Matteo Kries, director of the Vitra Design Museum. And I'm super happy to have you here today, Daisy. That's great to see you virtually and everyone else who's out there. To know there's people out there is exciting. Yes, yeah. I think it's a great uh, medium that we're now really uh, using at the Vitra Design Museum, but also among a lot of other museums to you know, offer uh, discussions, debates to our audience. And um, as we had the pleasure, Daisy, to have an exhibition with you last year at the Vitra Design Museum, um, I thought you know, it could be an interesting thing to uh, extend some of the thoughts that were raised in the exhibition um, and uh, also speak about the current situation because uh, when we discussed this talk uh, previously, we both thought that it's quite interesting uh, links between the topics you're working on and the situation we're facing right now. Um, just to give a very, some very brief notes about your um, biography, Daisy, you were trained as an interaction designer. You wrote your PhD thesis on the question of better uh, at the Royal College of Art. You also have a tiny background in architecture, I think. A beginner, yeah. <laughs> I, did, I did my undergraduate in architecture. Um, and um, so now you're really working on the edge of nature and technology um, with different media uh, that you are combining in your works. And you had exhibitions in several museums, not only in the Vitra Design Museum, but also in really great, prestigious international other museums. Um, but before we enter those uh, topics of your work, you just uh, the, the standard question, where are, you, are we finding you and how do you see the situation at the moment at, at the UK, where I think you are at the moment? Yeah, so I am, um, well, it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to talk about this as well, because I think we're all, I don't know, myself certainly reached a point where the end doesn't seem in sight. And, you know, the question is, well, how... How do we live in this way? I'm in the English countryside, very lucky to just be about an hour outside London. My studio at Somerset House is currently locked. And um, so I'm finding myself surrounded by trees, which is actually a, a wonderful thing amidst all of this. And, you, you know, I think we're all looking at the world, trying to understand what's happening. And for me, the realization that biology has got us <laughs> well and truly now is something perhaps positive that can come out of so much tragedy. I think we've been living in the way that we feel emancipated from the natural world. And now suddenly we've realized that our economy is, in, is so delicately entwined with biology. Our lives are entwined with biology. And that's never been, there's never been any other way that it has been, but somehow we've been able to mask it. And now we've been completely stopped by an invisible piece of DNA machinery. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, <clears throat> you've been studying a lot of uh, microbes, um, micro elements in biology. <laughs> so I guess, and, and I would characterize your work as something that could be called speculative uh, design to a certain extent. Well, I'll, I'll debate that with you as well. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but, you know, um, looking at your work, uh, I, I'm still wondering whether you have ever thought about a scenario that we're living right now in, in your research. I mean, it's not so far away when you think about the power of biology and the possibilities that how this could influence our lives. Were you surprised by what happened in the last month? Um, or is it something where you would have always guessed that this can happen and maybe stronger than a normal person who is far further away from that? Oh, so, well, I'd like to, to oh, no, actually, I don't want to claim that I would know that this was happening, but um, I think, so I don't have a background in science. And when I first learned about synthetic biology was when I started my master's at the Royal College of Art in 2007. And I started to sort of delve into biology and then synthetic biology, the introduction of a, a friend of mine, Sasha Poflet. And 
I began to, I just decided to throw myself into it. I was so fascinated by this world that I knew nothing about and the scale and thinking about what design meant at that, when we're talking about the design of biological systems um, by humans at sort of tiny invisible scales. And I remember sort of thinking about, um, I actually wrote somewhere sort of biology doesn't respect borders and boundaries and that's a phrase that's being used on the news all the time and, it, and it's absolutely true we operate on a you know, we look at the world map and it's covered in lines and, and biology follows those lines to some extent because we put those barriers up that stop some of it but otherwise these things are kind of permeate boundaries and other ways and in the design interactions program where I was so fortunate to do my master's and my PhD under Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby. Um, we had this incredible DVD library, which <laughs> I wrote to Tony and Fiona a few weeks ago. And I said, you know, it feels like the DVD library is the, the reading list for this current situation, so the range of dystopian sci-fi and social fiction. And I think that the film that keeps on coming to mind is Soylent Green, um, because there's a, an element where a total world change is afoot there's a rupture in the world as we know it and that's not something i ever imagined i would actually experience i think i, I you know i feel the anxiety of climate change and climate breakdown and the biodiversity as an impending rupture but i and but i didn't expect that this rupture would happen quite so soon and i think that's a lot of well what people are feeling as well is that how is it even possible for the world as we know it to crumble around us, mm. um, especially from an invisible force. But now that it happened, or now that it's happening, um, you as someone who is, who is really looking at the, the edge of scientific knowledge about uh, these uh, forces of nature and possibilities to create with it. Mm. To, to so, yeah, yeah. A lot of my research over the last 10 or 12 years was Sort of around this topic of synthetic biology as scientists and engineers were describing what they were doing as design and as a young designer I was sort of completely amazed that you could think of biology in this way and then I you know I started to understand more about how we've been designing biology for a very long time by breeding plants breeding animals but now what was so the, the difference with what was happening was the ability to manipulate it at a DNA scale and think of DNA as a programming code. That reality is not, it's, it you know, turned out to be a bit more complex than that you can't just sort of sit down and program DNA in the same way, but with parallel advances in AI and uh, machine learning now, there's, you know, huge jumps forward. And I think what's interesting, you know, one of my collaborations in the last year and sort of long-term relationship um, in terms of collaboration is with Christina Agapakis at Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a biotech company in Boston. And one of the pieces that we showed in the exhibition Better Nature last year at Vitra was this um, smell hood that you could stand underneath and smell the smell of an extinct leucodendron, an extinct protea from South Africa. But now Ginkgo are doing a bit less of extinct flower <laughs> forensics and they're working on vaccinations and therapeutics and diagnostics for COVID-19. And I think that that's really, you know, synthetic biology has been so interesting because it is functional, but there is also this element where we can be creative with it. And I think that's, to me, what makes it a design material as well. And, you know, I've stepped a little bit away from synthetic biology towards looking at nature and technolo technology more broadly. But this idea that we can manipulate it, but ultimately we can't control it, I think sort of is so important for us to hold on to. Yes. Well, um, I'm not sure if all our audience is, is familiar with some projects. So you mentioned one already, uh, which is called Resurrecting the Sublime, where you try to recreate the smell of certain extinct, extinct plants. And another one was also shown in the exhibition in our museum was called The Widening of Mars. Not mm. really imagined not humans, plants uh, colonizing Mars, right? Yes, that was... Um... So it was a co-commission between um, the Vitra Design Museum and the Design Museum in London, who was holding an exhibition called Moving to Mars. I actually have the, the catalogue here, <laughs> show and tell. Um, and they asked me to come up with something to talk about, uh, 
humans going to Mars and colonization and, and I reacted quite badly <laughs> to that. The idea that humans deserve to colonize another planet, the idea that colonization is a word that is suddenly good when we talk about other planets and the ethical sort of dimensions of colonization are all you know, things we're recognizing on Earth, but suddenly it's all out the window when it comes to another planet. So I proposed creating a simulation of sending just plants and other organisms um, like lichens and cyanobacteria to Mars and letting them flourish there without us. And all we can do from Earth is just watch this garden grow, this wilderness be created on another planet. And it's an immensely complex project, but we um, managed to build this beautiful simulation where um, you can watch over a million years uh, this wilderness unfold. But what was really important for me was that we just we didn't show just one version of it. We showed multiple versions, these sort of landscape camera views so that you can watch different ways that the world can unfold at once. The path we're on is only one route. You know, we were all at the moment sort of thinking of these sliding doors moments. You know, if, if we'd behave differently in January, if we behave differently in February, how would the world be now? And I think it's a really important way because it gives us freedom to think that the world, the future, the present are all flexible and there is actually potential to change. And I think that's what's so interesting about this current moment as well. When, when I mentioned um, the word speculation, I think you reacted a little unhappy. So um, if it's for you, what, what is it? Is it a kind of extension of uh, science that you try to use uh, in the design field? Or how would you describe it in a more general way? I mean, I, 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 mean, I say that. Um, smiling because uh, obviously I studied with Tony and Fiona and they, they taught me so much and kind of set me on an amazing path and they've you know, written and coined this term speculative design mm -hmm. and it's just that I've sort of I've struggled a bit with it because of the term speculation I think you know lots of the methods I'm using are around fiction and storytelling and narrative are really important parts of my work I'm trying to take people on an emotional journey and enable them to to find themselves looking at the world from a different perspective. But I've, that's why I've started to think that maybe I feel more like an artist. Mm -hmm. And the other issue I have with speculation is that it, the word itself, um, beyond the design world, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of us within the design world who understand you know, the specific term, but it's so tied to financial um, or other kinds of mechanisms that there's often a misunderstanding about what it means. And yeah. I'm also try not trying to make predictions with my work. And as you know, I've sort of tested projects over the years, I started to find, but find some more comfortable working methods through all these experiments. I find that I'm sort of slightly wary of things looking like predictions and rather more interested in creating parallel worlds or worlds that reflect on the world that we're in. Mm. And so speculation might not be the right word. But ultimately, you don't need to know any of that to experience the work. And it's more like, I'm interested in what does it make you feel? And, that, yeah. and how might it change you as you experience it? Parallel words, I think, is a very nice description for it, or even parallel universes, no? But, um, Foucault uses the term heterotopia, which I find when I learned about it, it really sort of fits. It's worlds that aren't better, like utopias or worse, like dystopias, they're just different and yeah, describe them as spaces to reflect on, on the world that we're in. This, mm -hmm. this device of the mirror is super fascinating and, and is a really rich space for designers and artists to think in. Yes, and at the same time for me, the, the words that you are creating have a, a certain romantic aspect. So they, mm -hmm. they are very visual to me and also narrative. I think, you know, this, this whole idea of uh, Mars being colonized by plants and then you create wonderful uh, also uh, visuals to to show that so it's it's a nearly cinematographic uh, mm. approach, I would say um, I think that's a big part of it now that you're not leaving only the idea of plants inhabiting Mars but you're really um, visualizing it up to an extent where it gets very powerful also emotionally well, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. It's, I mean, it was really hard. I, I only have some tiny, tiny pictures here because I'm not in my studio. So I don't know if anyone could see little sort of um, <laughs> wilderness landscapes and um, the individual plants. 
created with an amazing team. It's a generative program um, where new plants mutate and evolve and new species that belong on Mars. And it is, um, yeah, I really like storytelling and I really like playing with aesthetics and using the, the aesthetic as a tool. So I'm particularly interested in, in the paintings of the sublime mm. and the purposefulness of that period as well, sort of you know, these classic uh, magnificent nature paintings that have so many um, sort of political messages and, and um, social messages encoded into them, sort of looking out as humans standing on the precipice, man standing on the precipice having gone somewhere extraordinary and looking at this dangerous nature but at the same time controlling it and I really am very interested in that device and so the, I mean there's two devices that I tend to use a, a lot one is that sort of pictorial language and the other is really the sort of the, the taxonomy of the Natural History Museum mm. and the taxonomy system but that's just because I'm obsessed with cataloging things. <laughs> yes um, and um... And you also um, once made this comparison to, to the engineer you know, who's, mm -hmm. who's um, solving problems. And you, you were saying in that, in, I think it was a talk at Design and Data, that this is not something that designers should, should just imitate or repeat. Mm -hmm. Engineers do that very well, mm -hmm. but um, designers can go at least one step further and try mm -hmm. to escape that linear logic of engineering and and then you also quoted Einstein, no? That that uh, we. He's, he's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the. Well, doing uh, the same thing over oh, and over again is um, sort of the is, sign of madness, or to paraphrase him poorly. But um, yeah, yeah I, well, the phrase was that we shouldn't use mm -hmm. the same kind of thinking to solve problems, mm -hmm. like the thinking we used when we created those problems. No? So it's really a matter of uh, parad changing paradigms <laughs> and not only solving problems. I think, I mean, this gets back to sort of questions of, of what design is and what it does, and um, which is why I went down the rabbit hole that is this question of better. I became sort of confused as a designer in training what it meant to be a designer. You know, I, I felt strongly that I didn't want to make mass produced products, that I didn't feel the need to contribute to mass production but I felt like a designer and became very interested in what does it mean to design and to me you know designing is an optimistic activity so you, you you know you create things to change the world according to what it what the world that you want so you know, if you're cold you create a blanket or if you need a home you build, you build a shelter you design a shelter these are, you know, these are simple examples, but sort of changing the existing to the preferred or better. But then there's, as I started to unpick it, there's a few different ways to think about it. There's, you know, so design has this optimistic core and um, Richard Howells, who's a sociologist, describes it as a utopian impulse. But if we think about um, what the preferred situation is, that's much more malleable. So we can say that there's... Um, you, know, you can look back at sort of 20th century design to really sort of start to unpick how there's different sets of what is better. Um, mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in the socialist sports clothes made in the 1920s by um, an artist, uh, Stepanova, in um, you know, creating a set of clothing that would embody a different set of ideals or, be, or more contemporary examples. Um, uh, Meta Smets, I think it's his name, the um, turtle car that he was making out in, in Ghana, uh, a Dutch artist, so creating this car from scrap parts that were taken from the incredible workshops in, um, in Ghana, creating a new model of a car that can be built from, from waste parts. And it's just a different model or fixed parts, uh, Daniel Charney's sort of movement that he helped start in the UK where people create design objects that aren't meant to be sold, they're just to help other people. And each of those embody a different set of values and a different set of ideas about what a better world is. So I think that you can start to sort of unpick design away from consumption and it's still an incredibly valuable exercise. And that's, to me, is what's, um, is the utopian idea around kind of bettering. So, so you're looking for design approaches which are going beyond the usual established concepts of better, which is better probably for a manufacturer or for 
certain groups, a limited group of people, but not looking at uh, having a holistic view of what is better for as many people as possible. Could we describe it like that? Well, this is the problem, is, is what is better. So I kept on hearing, working in synthetic biology, I would hear all these engineers and working in design and, work, and going to sort of tech conferences. Everyone's promising they're going to make the world better. And I began to wonder, well, what is better? <laughs> what, what, what are they imagining? And um, who will it be better for and who gets to decide? And as you start to analyze a particular product and you ask those questions, well, obviously there are very many different answers. There isn't one better that's going to fit everyone. You know, a, a, um, creating beautiful chairs sustainably is great. Creating markets for those chairs is definitely better than generating millions of you know, plastic bottles that go in the ocean that are used once. But so these are the questions of how as, you know, we design each thing. Do we think about this framework around it? What, um, and that's what I'm really interested in sort of doing at the moment is thinking about what are the value, you know, ways to kind of pin down these value systems and the outcomes that we're anticipating, and the goals that we have as we design systems. And for me, clearly what is better is designing in a more sustainable way, designing less, designing things that are more valuable that can be maintained um, but that also means that you still need to protect jobs because it's not better if people aren't working. And mm -hmm. those questions are even more important now um, at this time of enormous economic crisis for so many people. So how do we together as a society define better that suits more people, more species, the environment that can accommodate long term goals, short term goals? That's a really, really difficult question. And that's what I think we will need to be thinking about as as designers, as citizens, as business people, yeah. as members of the planet. So, so the, the, the link to your interest in synthetic biology from that idea of, of looking for the better, is it that you're interested in the system uh, where <laughs> design is embedded? Um, is it, yeah, because I'm wondering how you got from the interest in, in biology and your earlier projects in this specific study of the word better, which, you know, is, on the one hand, it's rather obvious to me that, you know, that it's the most common phrase that we hear about design. Designers try to make the world better. Okay, that's something we find in every, yeah. every, every design museum or design organization. So I, I think it's extremely good that you're questioning that mm -hmm. word. But how is it connected to your previous research into biology? Um, well, uh, I'm saying it suddenly got dark here because it's about to be the most enormous rainstorm outside. <laughs> so, um, so suddenly I haven't turned out the lights. Um, I just thought there's a question there saying, uh, it was Fixperts, was the, it's a UK led group designing things for people. Um, so the move from synthetic biology, with my PhD, I was looking at how different synthetic biologists, so all these synthetic biologists are promising that they can make the world better. And I became really interested in how um, different visionaries, and this sort of applies more broadly to the world, uh, but I was looking at in synthetic biology, how a visionary who imagines a better future gets other people along behind their vision, behind their imaginary, and makes that thing happen, and that those values get encoded into the things that they design. So they happen to be biological things, they can be open source DNA parts repositories, or they could be vats of face cream and vanilla flavor, or they could be uh, new kinds of crops. And those are all design objects um, in my view. But the sort of interests have sort of shifted more broadly because those are all, those are just methods, they're design methods. You know, how do you create institutions and um, forums and companies and conferences and all the things that you need to get people along the ride to deliver a vision and that applies equally in design, it applies in technology. And I sort of decided to take a step out and look more broadly though at our relationship with nature, because to me that is part of the problem is we invest all this money in these technologies that could solve the problems. We could design crops that can fix nitrogen using synthetic biology, but we haven't fixed the food system. Uh, you know, there's things that are social solutions, not technological solutions. And that's where the engineering sort of mindset is like we'll solve the problem but actually some of this stuff is human and social and can't necessarily be solved like we're, we're messy inconsistent animals and you know thinking about how we deal with that is um is really important and i think that's sort of also what i learned from working with all these engineers 
was, you know, if I think design is optimistic, there's also these other terms that we use in, in design around the optimum. There is no one best chair. You can go in the Vitra um, <laughs> warehouse, which I've been very lucky to do. You can look at all these amazing chairs and they're all equally wonderful to me, but they're all different. And there's not one that's the best. And that's because we all have individual preferences, there's different situations. There isn't a best, there's yes. multiple betters. And um, that's a good thing um, because it, it, it links to me to, to the question of evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, evolutionary process, there's, not, there's no limit. It's, it's, a, it's a process and still we're designing as part of an evolutionary process. And um, how can we still um, make judgment or design in a responsible way uh, without thinking that we've found the final solution. No? And I think that's something. <laughs> final <possible>. solution, dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, it is. But, but uh, no, there's, I mean, biology is just this endless possibility space. And I think that's what's so interesting to me about it is, and that's why it's been such fun to create these generative projects as well, where you can start to um, play within that possibility space. Um, I think, so it's really find, I'm interested in, in so it's not um, to biomimicry or copying nature, but thinking in a more biological way. And I think there's so many amazing artists and designers and practitioners who are moving towards this. You know, our friends, former Phantasma, hello, um, have you know, really shown with the amazing exhibition at the Serpentine. You've seen it? Um, You're yeah, I was very lucky to see it. And they, they actually gave um, me and my, my students, my teaching partners a tour. So I was so grateful. Um, and I think that really kind of sets up the complexity of the biological world. I mean, we think of these things as um, individual organisms. You know, I'm um, going to have to show you something really disgusting. Uh, here's a bumblebee <laughs> that landed on my desk. Um, but a bumblebee is, you know, it... it operates with a plant and many plants. It's not just, you know, and it's co-evolved with those plants. It's not, you know, we're so used to thinking of single things and single systems, whereas biology is this big complex optimization space. And that's sort of the third term that I find so interesting around sort of the um, optimism mm. of design, the idea that there is an optimum, but there's also this idea of optimization that you can um, sort of, you work within a possibility space. This is how engineers work. You know, there's a possibility space. There's a curve, and you're trying to reach this sort of perfect solution that fits all the parameters. But there's so many of us, and we're all different. And the the kind of scenarios we're operating in are different day to day, and it's just it's just messy. And that's that's biology, and we're biology. So <laughs> it's it's hard. So the, I think the, where we go next is thinking about how do we put those ideas and those systems. Um, how do we remap the world that we have and the economies we have onto this realization that it's just messy? Mm. When you look at the current situation, again, the, the corona lockdown, um, on the one hand, we see this, this comeback of biology that suddenly shows how we have forgotten these forces no? that, that are there every day. On the other hand, we see a lot of designers reacting to the situation you know, from 3D printing um, masks to a lot of other initiatives, um, helping people in hospitals, etc. Now, when you're looking at this as a person that who designs, who works as an artist, but also knows about biology, would you say this is enough or this is how designers can cope with the current situation? Or do you see possibilities of design or art coping in different ways the situation, mm -hmm. right? You know, if, if in your universes that you design, there could mm -hmm. be a possibility of designing this virus away, you know? Mm -hmm. Just, um, but in reality, probably not. But um, is it, do you see scenarios how designers could make use in different ways of what's happening at the moment and try to give other perspectives? Well, I think, I mean, I would say, you know, there's, like the exhibition last year, and we talked about this before, the, the Paolo Antonelli's um, Broken Nature, the Triennale in Milano, showed this incredible breadth of what designers can do. Mm -hmm. From the 
weird and esoteric <laughs> created the smell of extinct flowers i was very happy to be part of the show to much more practical um objects useful uh, sort of pregnancy tests that are more biodegradable these kinds of you know there is a huge spectrum and i what i'm saying is not that we should stop designing things it's more thinking about how design integrates into bigger systems and can help um think more responsibly and help other systems behave more responsibly or, or guide us as well so in the present situation you know, there's huge i mean what are we going to do <laughs> are we how are we going to retrofit our cities to accommodate social distancing until there's a vaccine or if there's a vaccine how do we get businesses factories um, restaurants bars you know people back in work and there is lots of work for designers to do i think it's incredible hearing the stories of designers sort of prototyping and, and getting sort of PPE out to, to healthcare uh, providers. And then there's all these other ways, you know, things, other models of design that are also important now, helping us think about where we go next. So not necessarily designing products, but acting as mediators between all these disparate things to kind of set out a vision and I think the imagination that design and art can provide is so important. And the critical imagination shouldn't be forgotten and is in fact, perhaps even more important. We're at this terrible moment, perhaps in human history, this rupture point where we could go, you know, there's lots of people saying, wow, the sky is a blue and it's, um, you know, this is incredible. We're, um, we can see how we can change. And I think that's amazing. But how do we make that change happen? And how can designers get involved in helping making those things happen? Is it about sort of the huge imaginative visualization of what it could be like? Is it about help, helping define those goals? It's, is it about thinking about other species? It's probably all of these things. And I hope it's all of these things. But we're in crisis and we're in multiple crises as a species and as a planet. And I don't think design can save the world, but I think that designers can really help us think about things and think about how we make better things. And according to you, not only um, designers that create products or less designers that yeah. create products in the engineering sense, mm -hmm. designers that think about um, our whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And for example, yourself, uh, you mentioned that for you, the, the situation at the moment is really difficult because yeah. these, like yourselves work a lot for museum commissions in the cultural context. So you're depending very much also in the future, um, you know, collaborating with institutions allow you to do the research. Um, and so the, uh, one question would be, how can we keep up that uh, space for designers like you to, to work even in a less commercial context because that's how we bring the design research forward right i mean this is this is the the, the million dollar even like the ten thousand dollar question at the moment um yeah my studio has been terribly hit by the crisis and i had an amazing team and i've had to let them go and i'm totally devastated you know the complete cancellation and postponement of the art and design world in its um, sort of cultural formats in terms of museums, galleries and events is postponed mm -hmm. indefinitely. And where we go next, what that looks like is um, kind of like deeply concerning. There's elements where there's a, a very good moment to rethink. You know, I've um, already had made some big decisions this year about traveling less this was before the, the crisis now i'm definitely traveling less but um i realized how much i was traveling to to kind of set up exhibitions and how much the work is traveling and it's really problematic so i think there is an exciting moment i don't think we should shift the whole universe online um that also has an ecological impact of course but how do we rethink exhibition making how do we rethink how we engage with audiences um yeah. how can we create things that have an online component that is meaningful and um different as good as better it, a different way of engaging that connects with the physical work so we don't all need to travel it's not just dumping content online i think so i think there are real opportunities to think about 
how we do things differently and how we can reach more people and tell more stories that are more powerful. But, you know, how we support the practitioners um, is, you know, we're, we're going to have to be, <clears throat> we have to be <laughs> diverse, you know, um, sort of painting pictures, <laughs> less to do. <laughs> but I'm trying to write my book. Um, what is happens... it reading Jane Austen? <laughs> Oh, you read a lot of Jane Austen. Yeah, totally. movies, so. <laughs> yeah I was, I've been trying to think, what does a slower world look like? Um, and that's a really interesting question because, you know, I, I was listening to David Attenborough um, talk about his new film that's going to come to Netflix soon. And I, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a very important film for how we think about climate breakdown. And he, you know, he had one, one lesson is just we need to waste less. So as we move to the slower lifestyle, yeah, as we consume so much less now, how do we keep that? How do we consume well? How do we consume things that are valuable to us that we keep and you know, see the value in, in the objects? So yeah, <laughs> I have been reading and watching Love Jane Austen because I'm in the countryside and he's waiting three weeks for a letter to arrive. And it's like, this is what life was like 200 years ago for some women. And you just waited for the world to happen to you. You weren't free in the way- Beautiful garden, no? Looking, I'm very lucky to be looking at a beautiful garden, but the idea that you couldn't have this instant gratification. You know, I'm very lucky now. I've been I'm talking to a botanist in Hawaii next week and a whale scientist in South Africa last week. But um, on the other hand, life is suddenly slow and I've not, we're all having to adjust to that. So I think that's also an amazing opportunity for businesses and designers and people to rethink the offer do we need exhibitions to be changed so fast can we make deeper programming around exhibitions can we create you know instead of having four exhibitions or six exhibitions do you have fewer and you really invest in in sort of um other kinds of program programming around them um so that maybe those are some of the ways that, that our little world changes that can have ramifications elsewhere well, museums might not be able to afford uh, so many exhibitions yeah per year in the future so um, you know, in that case it might also be an ecological advantage um, or do what we do less but better yeah uh, it may also be about the um, the changing mission and you know as we all need to think about how we engage with the environmental crisis you know maybe this is where um, we can become more political as individuals activists as institutions where we can find different ways to engage different audiences as well that bring different kinds of value i think the, the, well in that case the question of the future of designers like you or the work of designers like you and the future of design or art museums is quite closely linked no? mm. because it's really uh, the, the platform on which many of your projects have emerged or in the academic context mm. Um, so these institutions will certainly continue and um, I think the interest in topics like the ones you're looking at in the museum and in the cultural world would rather grow I think mm -hmm. because we you know if if institutions have realized it by now that it's not about exhibiting only the object the beautiful product but um, the world we're living in and the design questions that this world raises, mm. I think it will happen, you know, that the corona crisis will foster that. And um... I think so part of where I've struggled with um, so the work I've been making is, you know, I often I get asked, you know, what is the role of the artist in the ecological crisis and how can you make it better? It's like, I have no idea. <laughs> I can tell the stories that I want to tell that I feel are important and join dots and join people. Um, but I've still not been sure about the next step, which is how do you then drive change and impact? And that may be part of how we all work together as well, is um, finding those methods. There's maybe a, a different ecosystem that we tap into that's you know, creating less you know, object-focused, more process-focused exhibitions that have, and that's why I thought it was so interesting about what former Phantasma have done, and is challenging for some people as well, just saying, you know, this is research and the, the research is on the, um, on the objects that they designed and the research yeah. is actually the exhibit. 
And I think that's a really important step. And I really hope that show opens again. I know I'm really singing their, singing their praises, but um, I found it, you know, the sort of tying together the aesthetics that designers can bring and the, um, you know, seducing us with products that are beautiful, but actually that become, you know, suddenly the humble paper cup is elevated to the work of art in the gallery. And then there's opportunity for all these conversations to, to, with different disciplines around it that can actually instigate change and engage people. Well, I think the former Phantasma exhibition at the Serpentine has had a huge response mm -hmm. even before the corona crisis hit. I was really struck by you know, the, the intensity of the debate and communication that happened around the exhibition. Mm -hmm. so I think that showed that even before the crisis, um, there, there is this moment for such exhibitions and the interest for, for these very research-driven uh, analysis of design. Also, thanks to the program they created around it, this uh, series of talks. Uh, so I think they, it was really smart of them to see the exhibition as, as a kind of information program that happens in the gallery space, also online, and that really goes back very fine to history. You know? I, I love the the images they they um, yeah, must they're, they're, have taken years to to research them, and I think that's a, a beautiful aspect if designers have the the resources to do that. I think, and I think that's then the next step as well is is where um, how can and that's what I've looked a lot in my work is how you know by engaging with the synthetic biology community, you know I was hanging out at science conferences and labs for years, really part of the community in, in many ways. I'm not a scientist, but I was a, a fixture. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, for me, with the, that they were one of the audiences for the work and a really important audience for the work. So the pieces that were in the show at Vitra, I've shown first to scientists mm -hmm. at, at sort of science conferences to get their thoughts and to spark mm -hmm. discussion and debate and fights and, and so all sorts of um, controversy and a really good, dis really good for me as proof that this work is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So the questions, you know, now that I'm asking around ecology more broadly in our relationships with, you know, why do we invest so much money in AI and we invest nothing in protecting rhinos? And that's mm -hmm. one of the topics of um, my recent work, The Substitute, mm -hmm. is then to, how can you use those projects, those artworks to reach the right people? Yeah. So I'm really sad, but also happy that it's been rescheduled. I'm meant to be talking um, at the IUCN, the Biodiversity Congress, which is now in January in Marseille, on a panel about storytelling. And you know, this is an audience of scientists and um, biodiversity conservationists and policymakers. And the panel is comprising um, filmmakers, video game designers, myself, um, people who tell stories and talking about how can we tell these positive stories about change and getting very different audiences. But I also want to show the work there to that scientific audience to say, like, how do we, you know, can you tell stories back to the science? Um, and how does that dialogue actually help create a, like a, a better definition of what better could be it's more more deeply informed and to bring so you have a much um, stronger flow between what we make and the scientific understanding of the world yeah i think you're you're one of the designers that is really closest to to these other fields of research and, and science um and you know just Maybe one last question I'm interested in uh, regarding your own work as a designer and or artist. Uh, you, you mentioned an influence of Dan and Raby, um, with whom you you studied. Um, but the, the re studying the relation of nature and design is um, is a practice that has um, appeared throughout design history several times. If we think about the 1990s when people were using the word bio design. But uh, you use the word mimicry, I think. Mm, biomimicry, yeah. So it's when people make things that look, look uh, like. Yeah, so copy natural forms to. Yes, uh, copy them. Um, but, but still, I think even in the times when biomimicry happened, they reflected an interest, a deeper interest in uh, the forces of the form giving forces of nature, but maybe they were still lacking the means of 
transmitting that on to their design work. But also if you go further back in the late 19th century in, in Art Nouveau, you know, there was mm. huge interest in, in drawings of plants and how they evolved. And then we find this in design. Um, so when, when I ask you what, what were influences that you uh, absorbed in your work besides contemporary science and critical design, Dan Raby, would you also say it comes from there? It comes from... I, I, also, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> so, um, I you know, spent a lot of time as a kid um, wandering around in the woods, making dens for myself out of sticks So, <laughs> and sort of growing things. So I think there's a very strong influence there for me. And, um, but I also think that, and I think that, so I think it's a term, um, now perhaps and and this word that's being used more around interspecies design and and some non-human perspectives um are becoming becoming much more cognizant of how we need to be thinking of the other things that inhabit this planet whether they're organisms or rivers or mountains and how we need to give them rights and i think from a design perspective thinking about um you know, so art nouveau was for a human it's like simulating a natural environment but how do we actually think not about the human as the beneficiary of the work, but other species? And I've been working on something at the moment that's sort of towards that end, that it's not about generating something for human aesthetics, it's about generating it for other organisms and trying to um, use their special skills and powers to actually create some the research that's been done um, by scientists to actually integrate that into the process to design something for those things. I can't say what it is yet, but um, it's been a really interesting process to really think and then you know to not just have the human or just not have those organisms perspectives but then the human perspective led back in so how do you create something that actually works between species mm -hmm. and for and from our different perspectives and I think um so moving on from biodesign or biomimicry it's actually you know everything that we make we need to be thinking how does it function on the planet and how yeah. does it function as part of a big system and it's not just a plastic bottle it's going to go into a whale's stomach. How does that whale then survive? Mm. You know, how, how do we think of everything as interconnected? So as a designer, the responsibility is enormous and that may be you know, completely overwhelming, but that's why teaming up with all these experts is so rewarding because you yeah. can learn all this stuff. And um, mm. you can kind of think, you can really learn how to think in, in totally different ways and bring all these different expertises. Daisy, should we take some questions? Yeah, I would love to hear what people, sure. I want to I, know what people think a better sorry? future is. I really want to know what people, how people yes. can, you know, people listening, like what, what one thing do you think will be better um, mm. after this or what would be, it should be aspired to, to change for the better? Yes. So let's see if, if we get some questions from people. There's a certain Vivian Stadtmanns that I see who... Hello. Uh, <laughs> Um, a question regarding the, the commissioning practice among museums and institutions and designers art. Can't see the question right now, really, but I think I see the half of it. Is commissioning a practice that can create more powerful connections between institutions, yes. arts, and designers? Um, oh. Well, I mean, I was very lucky to work with Vivian, so I'd say absolutely yes. Um, but I think it's um, completely. So the four new works I've made since I finished my PhD involved you know, being commissioned sometimes by multiple institutions because of the, the ambition of what I wanted to do. So having to create inter-institutional relations as well. And it's so valuable. You know, Paul Vivian got endless questions for me saying, you know, what did people think? And asking me how to fill in sort of questionnaires because I wanted to know what the audience was getting from it because I was iterating the work as well. And that is so valuable. Um, you know, maybe I'm, I'm unusual like that, but um, I think developing programs with institutions, developing new works with them, and finding ways to bring other people into those institutions is all mm -hmm. for me is, is the most exciting thing about the practice. Yeah, now we're getting interesting questions. Uh, I'm collecting them. So one question was, how are you getting the scientific information that you that you need? How how is the connection with the researchers? Um, well, I always say that the, <laughs> the scientists I end up working with are the ones who reply to my emails. So it's, um, you, know, you can email a lot of scientists, you might not get a reply, but there'll be one who's so intrigued that they'll get back to you. Yeah. And 
really, I mean, it's, there's, there's a, you know, I tend to read to scientific papers. I'll start with a Google search that takes me to the popular science version of the paper, then you delve into the paper. And then, you know, if you're feeling brave, you can write to the scientist and if you don't hear from them. You can write to one of their students and that's often a better way to one of their postdocs. And it's really, you know, as a, when I was getting into this, it's like, well, you just ask one question that's really easy for them to answer and um, not, not your life story. And then it's too tempting for them not to deal with the email straight away. <laughs> that's the way in. So there was another question, um, which I, I don't know how this works. Uh, uh, can I bring it back? Uh, the, more or less, the question was, will the, the relevance of works focusing on aesthetics Mm. Uh, still be there if there's a shift on to a, a, a focus um, shift in the focus on works with ecological mm. relevance mm. how were, how about the, uh, the the relevance of aesthetical works well, i think the natural world to me is pretty beautiful maybe i'm a human who's specially programmed to to really really find it aesthetically pleasing but i think also aesthetics is a human construct and it's a really interesting tool to manipulate so for me trying to aspire to beauty as a way to manipulate the viewer is a very interesting process so i aspire to making beautiful work that often uses existing conventions and sort of playing with that as a as a, almost as a theatrical method um but also because it, it gets us, you know, you, you're seduced by it, so you want to look at it. And then in the work, there's always, for me, so I want to put a twist in that makes you slightly uncomfortable. So I did a, um, a commission with ADO um, and, the, and Somerset House last year called Machine Auguries, where I rebuilt the Dawn Chorus using machine learning with an amazing team to make that happen. Um, and you sit in this room and listen to the dawn chorus and it's beautiful, but a lot of the birds are machines. And there's this very strange, um, sort of weird sound and something's not quite right, but it's still beautiful. And there's always that element. So that's also an aesthetic exercise. So for you, it's, it's rather a, a tool that you're using no? within, <laughs> within your narratives. It's not, a, it's not a purpose per se, but you're trying to use it as a part of your of your program. I mean, I like nice looking things. So <laughs> 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 I mean, like, aspire to make beautiful work. I think mean, I can't. I mean, I've made beautiful, tried to make beautiful work about shit. So, um, and, and and we had two of those pieces in, in Better Nature. One a collaboration with James King, and, and one an enormous golden intestine. So you know, there's beauty in everything. It just depends yeah. how you look at it. Interesting question, Daisy, that I see right now. How do we not fall into the same trap with bio like we fell into with tech optimism? Mm. I think that's a really good question. And, you know, um, a student asked me last week, um, you know, do you think tech is a force for good? And like, when the tech is, you know, we make tech. We, we decide what we do with it. It can be good, it can be bad. And, um, you know, what I really want to get away from is this solutionist mindset that we can solve all the problems with technology or with design or with biotechnology um, when so much of it is either maybe not solvable as humans um, or is messy and complicated and is something social. But I would really recommend Evgeny Morozov's book, um, Solutionism, on that. He talks about it really beautifully. Yeah, yeah. So um, someone else is asking, um, you, you were mentioning, you know, that uh, institutions might more focus on program, pro educational program around exhibitions they're doing. Um, and then the question was, what kind of programs would you think about? You know, if you could um, wish what an institution would build around your own exhibition, um, once you have your first big retrospective or, or uh, um, project show, what would you propose? Um, Oma Fantasma was an interesting example, what they built themselves, what would you do? I think, um, I think it's connect, so, so much of what we need to do is about bottom up, top down, <laughs> sideways changes. So what can we do as individuals? What can we do as um, citizens voting for our governments as activists, you know, challenging our governments as governments creating laws, as international organizations creating um, intergovernmental things. So how, you know, what is the role of a cultural institution? Maybe this is a question for you. 
is um, you know, in connecting all those dots, is it about um, creating policy, some forums for policymakers where you know, you're doing something slightly different um, to what they're normally doing and somehow they can be distracted. But I, and I think that's where, you know, and then you, you have a public forum where members of the public can interact in a different way with a different set yeah. of agendas. And I think that's what I would love to see is, um, you know, I've been thinking about sort of the climate talks. I was very fortunate um, to go for a day to the COP25 um, climate talks last year thanks to um, the Thyssen Museum, Thyssen Bornemitz Museum. Oh. And um, you're watching all these people talking about the future of the climate in air-conditioned boxes inside air-conditioned convention hall. And that convention hall obviously is now a oh. hospital. It's so weird. Like, why does that not happen in a forest? <laughs> why do we, um, you know, why, and how can cultural institutions create these sort of opportunities for change? I think that's a really something I'd love to think about. And they're all flying in from around the world, you know. Yeah, including me, and I, you know, I felt appalling doing it. But um, <laughs> maybe one last question, which I saw. I don't know how I can find it again, but um, um, I liked that question. Uh, well, it was. I can't find it now, but um, it was more or less. Um, uh, yeah, are we living in a renaissance of romanticism, observing nature, but actually looking at design nature that got shaped by us humans? Um, I think that's an interesting point. Yes. The question, what is nature? You know, is nature really untouched and natural, in the sense of untouched, or isn't it all shaped by us? Well, Mars is the only nature, I think, that we have. Um, <laughs> I think there is, you know, the na nature is a human construct, and, um, you know, Timothy Morton, the philosopher, is a great sort of reference point for thinking about this. We, you know, the, the nature that we see outside is modern, you know, been modified by humans mm. since we've been around. But so I, you know, to sort of think of like this division between what's natural and what's not, in the same way that wilderness is a construct, you know, it's got a fence around it, and we create, mm. you know, we manage wilderness. It's not a, a real thing. It's these are all labels that we put on the world to understand it. Yeah. I think um, if more people are looking at nature, whether it's human mediated or not, that's a really good thing, and that's been an interesting outcome of all of this is how people are. Um, I saw a really nice meme, which was you know, before the before the lockdown, everyone's sitting around looking at their phone. Now, after the lockdown, everyone's desperate to be in the park and going for walks or going into nature. And that is something people are really talking about at the moment. They're suddenly observing the spring and, and becoming much more aware because it's the only thing to do to get outside. So whether we're looking at a human modified version or whether we're looking at the pure, real, untouched thing, I think all of it is, um, yes, it's romantic because we're suddenly seeing it as other and the crucial thing is how do we get back into it and how do we see ourselves as part of it not separate from it so i think um that's a nice um closing remark no that uh, a certain romanticism which is linked to nature may also be uh, a driving force for for research and that, that keeps us awake and interested in that world that we're living in uh, and if it would say the the opposite of that romanticism would be cynicism or sarcasm. It's probably always better to be on the romantic side and just try to understand that, that um, myth of nature, no? and then try to use, and also use beauty in order to tell stories about it and make us curious. Oh, I, I just think we're enormously privileged to exist on this planet. So finding, creating time, demanding time, to be able to have that nature in our lives, whether we live in cities or not, or, or where we are, like that is the, the rebalancing act that we need to make. Um, and how, whether we can even solve it, I don't know, and whether we can solve it equitably, but I, I doubt not. So the question though is how do we make steps towards that? And, mm. and that's, I really think is what we need to be thinking about. We're not gonna suddenly change everything by next year we should be demanding and that's what you're... something different. Yeah, yeah, I think your, your work does great contributions to that and, and really is eye-opening um, in, in order to understand you know, what's, what's happening in, these, in those years. Um, 
So I really wish you all the best uh, for the next projects that you'll, you'll be working on, Daisy. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure we'll also have the, the, the opportunity to collaborate again for the Vitra Design Museum. Let's, yeah, let's change the world. Let's make it better. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. I really, it's been really great to, to kind of think about it. I'm really grateful for everyone who's been asking questions as well, because as we all said in our little, our little boxes, it's so nice to, to be hearing what other people are thinking. Thank you very much, Daisy. It was a pleasure to have you.